Good afternoon, Erdev. Is everyone having a good day? Has everyone been having a good conference? Excellent. That's what I like to hear. My name is Dylan Beatty. This afternoon, I am going to be talking to you about webmasters, full stack developers, and other legends. And before we start, I would like everyone please to stand up. Okay, so stay on your feet if you build or if you have ever built websites. Good, I think that's just about everybody. Uh, stay on your feet if you've ever written JavaScript without using a framework. Okay, pretty impressive. Stay on your feet if you've ever had to use document.layers. Cool. Now, by the people who are still standing, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Put your hand up if you ever had a business card with the word webmaster on it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, just the last few of you who are standing up there, just stand up again. I'm going to give out some, some preemptive swag. You'll understand why at the end. So, I have these 3D printed save icons. There's one for you. One for you. Oops. <laughs> one more over, over here. Here you go. Yep. And one in the corner there. Okay, you're going to hang on. Oops, sorry. They're sharper than they look. This is why we went Wi-Fi. Hang on to those. You're going to need them at the end. Now, before we get started, uh, just before I came on stage here today, um, I received some very disturbing news. Uh, there is apparently somebody here at the conference who has been building software without the appropriate qualifications. Mr. Connery, could you please come up on stage? <laughs> now then, the charges against you are that you've been a professional software developer without completing a college degree. Yes and you have been acting as an imposter these years. How do you plead? <laughs> it's all right, folks. This is, this is just theater. <laughs> now, fortunately, fortunately for you, we found out about this heinous crime of yours here in a very progressive state of Sweden, where they have recently instituted a new policy for incarcerating dangerous criminals such as yourself. You are going to be sentenced, but we're going to give you a choice as to how it is you will serve your sentence. So in one scenario, you will go to jail. We will lock you in a cell, like this one here. But because we're progressive, you can keep your internet connection and your phone. And we'll give you a postal address. So you can work remotely. You can use Netflix, you can keep your bank account, you can use uh, Spotify, you can make Skype calls with your kids and your family, you can order things from Amazon, you can order food from Just Eat. You're only allowed outside to go to hospital, to vote, to go to court. You're not allowed to travel. We're going to lock you up, but you retain all of your digital privileges. So this is, this is scenario number one. The other scenario is we take away your internet. You are free. You can Go anywhere you like. You can see whoever you wish to see. You can travel. You can see the world. Well, if you can find an airline who will let you buy a paper ticket with cash, because you can't use the internet. No more online check-in. You can't have email. No Skype. No downloading, no uploading. You have to buy vinyl with cash. <laughs> Which one of these scenarios would you choose? Before you make a decision, would you like to know how long you have been sentenced for? 12 hours. <laughs> so out of people in the room, let's, Rob, by the way, thank you, is not guilty of anything. None of us is qualified to do what we do. We all do it incredibly well anyway, and it's one of the greatest things about this industry is how open it is to people who are self-taught, who learn from each other the way we're learning from each other. So let's give Rob a big hand, and then I'll go out and buy his book. <laughs> Thank you. So of the people in the room, let's say that you were sentenced to something and those were your two choices. Say you had a one week. One week of house arrest with internet or one week of no digital, no online. How many of you would prefer to stay home with broadband? A month? 
Six months? A year? It sounds unthinkable, you know, this idea of being offline until, well, when I was born in the late 1970s, that was how the entire human species lived all of the time, you know? Many, many people, there's probably people in this room who grew up in what now seems to us this unimaginable state of deprivation because the internet and the World Wide Web have absolutely transformed the world. There are probably people in this room whose parents met through an algorithm. They'll tell you they met at a Pearl Jam concert, but, you know, internet dating's been around a long time. Yeah, the internet has changed the world, the World Wide Web has changed the world, the way that we work, the way that we interact, the way we socialize, all of this has been transformed beyond recognition. And what I want to do this afternoon is sort of look back at how we got from there to here. What have we learned along the way? What were the ideas, the innovations, the technologies? And maybe reflect on a couple of things that, you know, lessons that we should have learned and perhaps we didn't. So, a little bit of a history lesson. 1960s, uh, ARPA, or DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects, something or other, an American military organization, they want to come up with a network where if one of the machines on the network suddenly was to not be there anymore for some reason, it wouldn't be a huge problem. That became the ARPANET. The ARPANET became the internet. Uh, Xerox PARC in 1974 did a thing called the mother of all demos. They had a, so 1974, they have a prototype machine. It's got a graphical display, it's got digital audio, it's got a mouse, it's got Ethernet, it's amazing. They completely failed to do anything with it. If they had, we would all be using Xerox smartphones right now. Anyone in here got a Xerox smartphone? Nah. The year that I would argue that the internet evolved over many, many years, but the year that I would argue was the year the internet was invented. Yeah, that's fine. Get to it. There are blank slides in here, but thank you. The year that the internet was invented, I think, was 1982. Two things happened in 82. One of them was they agreed that TCP IP was going to be how my network would talk to your network and to your network, your network. Suddenly, for the first time, there was a standard for inter-network connections, the internet. The other thing that was ratified in 1982 was SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Spam was invented about 15 minutes later. But for the first time, all of these researchers at institutes and companies all over the world had a way of communicating with each other immediately, effectively for free. That it didn't cost anything to send and receive email. And that unlocked this amazing new platform for collaboration and developing ideas. And this took off in a big way. There were all sorts of things. There was FTP, there was email, there was Gopher, there was Usenet, there was Telnet. And then in the early 1990s, this guy, who knows who this is? He is web developer. Yes, this is Tim Berners-Lee. His job title is web developer. His job title is actually the web developer. <laughs> Thank you, Hanselman, for that joke. Um, Tim was working at CERN in the early 1990s, and he kind of the, the rationale behind the project he was doing was he wanted a way he could publish papers without having to go through a publishing cycle. He wanted a way of being able to put stuff online and say to all of his colleagues, Hey, look, you know, we've got something online. He was actually interested in physics papers. CERN was a physics research institute. And he, you know, we credit Tim as the inventor of the web, but he actually specified, he published specifications for three things. Anyone want to take a guess at what those three things are? What are the three things Tim actually invented? HTML is one, HTTP is another, kind of hyperlinks is something a little bit more specific. And this one everyone always misses because it's so ubiquitous. He invented the URL. Three things. And these three things are separate. HTML is a document markup format. It supports hypermedia, but it is not mandatory. You can use it to mark up plain text for offline publication without any hyperlinking whatsoever. HTTP is a transport protocol. We use it now to send things backwards and forwards in all sorts of formats, streaming images, JSON, XML, all kinds of things. And URIs were, for the first time, a network agnostic, protocol agnostic way of saying, I have a resource that I have shared with the world and it is here. This is how you find it, this is the server that hosts it, this is how that server will find the resource that I have asked you to go and pick up. So, we fast forward. This is fairly successful. Before long, this thing comes out. This is NCSA Mosaic. This is the first graphical browser. 
the first browser ever that was capable of showing you images and text on the same screen at the same time. For reasons I will never understand, they decided that the default background would be this sort of gray color. And lots of people copied that, and I don't know why. Um, but at this point, the web started to take off. There was a, a real buzz about it. But the stack that powered that first revolution, that first wave of people getting online, was this. It was a file system full of static HTML. On top of that, there was a very simple server, HTTPD, which later evolved into Apache. Now we have dozens of choices of servers to choose from. HTTP was the transfer mechanism, and then you had a client, NCSE Mosaic, which before very long would become Netscape, which we'll talk about in a second. Are you familiar with the expression full stack developer? Now this stack, it was just about possible for one person to understand everything that was happening at every layer in that stack. The problem space was sufficiently small and well-defined that someone really smart could probably sit down for a week or two, and they could build the graphical client, they could implement the transport protocol, they could implement the server, and they could implement the underlying file store. As an interesting thought experiment, there are four verbs in HTTP, four very common verbs, get, put, post, and delete. If you had this stack, and your file system was keeping JSON files on disk, could you use that as a NoSQL database? You can think about that one later. The stack evolves. Things get exciting. Netscape happens. They spin off. There are, there are two ways in which uh, that original Mosaic application lives on today. The rendering engine and some of the source code in it ended up in Microsoft. And some of the engineers, a guy called Mark Andreessen, who went on to become something of a celebrity in the first sort of dot-com bubble, split off to start a new company, which he called his Mosaic Killer, which became the Mosaic Killer, which became Mozilla. So that's the etymology of that, that particular name. Now, I mentioned a second ago that there were four verbs in this initial uh, sort of implementation of HTTP, get, put, post, delete because Tim Berners-Lee envisaged the web as something that everybody could edit. And you had the same mechanism you used to read data was offered as a mechanism for writing data. Netscape shipped with a browser and it shipped with a tool called Composer. Composer was a way of writing websites and publishing them to the web. It fell by the wayside relatively quickly because what happened as soon as people started to smell money is the whole playing field changed. Now, one of the interesting other things that Netscape did, they charged money. Netscape Navigator cost $50. That was their business model. They didn't rely on advertising networks. They didn't rely on monetizing consumer data. They used this very, very old-fashioned idea where if people work hard and they create something, they shouldn't be able to charge money for the work that they did. So Netscape's original business model, now it came as a free trial that was supposed to run out after 90 days, but I think mine is actually still running. So I don't think that, that ever happened. But it's interesting, reflect the initial days of the World Wide Web, people paid for browsers. It was seen as you know, commercial software, just like most other office and corporate software was in those days. Microsoft smelled the potential. They came in, they started developing something called Internet Explorer based on the code base that they had acquired from Mosaic. Netscape had better technology. Netscape got to market first. Netscape had a better standards compliant implementation of HTML and these new specifications. There was only one thing Microsoft could do to compete with them, and that was to compete on price. The idea in 1993, 94 of Microsoft giving things away for free was absolutely unheard of. We have Netscape to thank for that, that first you know, Microsoft's foray into, why don't we give it away, and then we'll work out how to make money back out of it somewhere else. They also, at this point, decided that the standards, the W3C consortium, was not ratifying new ideas fast enough for them to impress people with ooh, shiny. So they started deviating. Netscape came along, and they went, ooh, we got a good idea. People are more likely to embrace our browser if it flashes, because as you're all getting first-hand experience of now, flashing content is really innovative and it really draws your attention to things, and it's not remotely distressing. It's all right, I'll stop. 
Blink was the first shot fired in what we would come to know as the browser wars. It wasn't a standard. It was in Netscape. It wasn't in anything else. Microsoft went, we can do better than Blink. We can have text that slides sideways. They came up with Marquee. At this point, we suddenly had these two browsers which were compatible up to a certain point, and then they began to deviate. And initially, it was just silly little gimmicks like Blink and Marquee, some stuff that was not terribly useful for developing any real applications. But once this precedent had been established, the browser vendors were just innovating and innovating and innovating with very little kind of communication between them and with very little respect for what was being encoded in the standards. There was a period of several years around the late 1990s where if you were doing anything sophisticated in a browser, you basically had to build it twice. You would have a big thing at the top of your code which said if document.layers and then you would have a couple of thousand lines of this is how Netscape does my application. Then you'd have else, and then you'd have this is how Internet Explorer does the application. And you'd stay up all night testing everything in these two browsers, and you'd launch it, you'd go home. Next day you'd get an angry phone call because it turns out that the client who's paying the bills is one of those special people who's using Internet Explorer 5 on Mac OS 9, which was like a whole other thing which had nothing in common with any other browser on the planet. And then you'd stay up another night testing that. And every time you tested something, you had to go and make sure you hadn't broken any of the implementations in any of the other browsers. Now, alongside this history of the World Wide Web, there is something else going on in the area of computer innovation. Apple Computer launched in the late 1970s to great fanfare and applause. And in the mid-1980s, there was a hostile takeover. Steve Jobs, the visionary innovator who founded Apple Computer, although he didn't actually solder the bits together, that was Wozniak, Steve Jobs was booted out. He went across the street and he founded a company called Next, Next Computers. They're interesting for two reasons. One of them is when Tim Berners-Lee was developing the World Wide Web, he built it on a Next system in C++. The other reason they're interesting is Steve Jobs and Next Computer were really only selling computers to two different companies. They had a couple at CERN, and all the rest of them were going to some guys in California who had this crazy idea about making films using computers. And so Steve went to pay them a visit. This was the company who would become Pixar. And he liked what he saw, and he bought some stock in it. That's what made him a, his first billion? Billion. It was nothing to do with Apple. Steve Jobs became a billionaire the first time around by buying stock in Pixar based on the fact they were using their technology. Fast forward to 1997, Apple decide that as hard as this is, actually today it's a little bit easier to believe. Six months ago it was hard to believe, but in the late 1990s, Apple were a spent force. They weren't doing anything. They had a very loyal user base of people who'd been using Apple right from the original the, the Lisa and the Apple II. But they weren't innovating. They weren't doing anything exciting. They were just churning out beige computers that didn't run Windows. And nobody really saw a future in it. Next bought Apple, or Apple bought Next. I forget which way around it was. Long story short, Steve Jobs is back at Apple running the show. He starts having good ideas again. He comes out with this. Every computer that anyone had seen up until this point was either beige or gray. You know, the really slick laptops were a sort of charcoal gray color. Everything else was beige, so it would go with your orange office furniture from the 1970s. This was the iMac. This was stunning. You know, I, I remember the, the fanfare that came out when this machine was launched. People were like, is that a computer? That's amazing. Well, that's what half of them were saying. The other half of them were saying, that's never going to work. It doesn't have a floppy disk drive. How can you have a computer without a floppy disk drive? How do I save my work? And Apple was saying, no, you don't need to. It has a modem. This is, this is an internet computer. You can save your work by emailing copies. You don't need to save things onto disk to exchange them. You can email files, you can FTP, you can browse the web. There's all sorts of things you can do with this machine that you're not used to, you've not come across before. And this kind of established a precedent. So first of all, they come out with a computer without a floppy drive. It's an absolute smash hit runaway success. A few years later, they come out with a music player. Does anyone remember when the first iPod was launched, Slash dot, uh, the news website did a review of it, where they summarized the iPod as Firewire only, less space than a nomad, lame, was their review of the thing. They called that one wrong. And the same backlash, people like, it's only Firewire and it doesn't have a changeable battery and you can't swap out the storage. Why is anyone going to use this? iPod was a huge success. A few years after that, 
Apple come out with a, a phone, a mobile phone that doesn't have a keyboard. Does anyone in here have a phone in their pocket which has a physical keyboard on it? Okay, wow, we fit, every time I've, I've done this talk before, there's been one or two BlackBerry diehards still in the room. We've hit zero, that's it. Keyboards are finished. But it was the same backlash. You know, everyone was like, touch screens don't work. How can you have a phone that doesn't have a keyboard on it? Anyone who's been following the news this year will have noticed that the new Apple, anyone here got the new iPhone 7? Yeah, phone without a headphone jack? Never gonna work, everyone needs headphones? The jury's still out. I'm not convinced on that one, but I'm open to being convinced in time. It's an interesting take. A lot of people think innovation is about adding things. Innovation is about creating something new. Innovation is about building on top of what you've already got. Apple, I think, have pioneered this path that you can actually innovate by taking something away. You can be as, uh, the, what was the hashtag, courage? The, you know, why we did it? But they have done some incredibly brave things that have ended up being successful, but as a consequence of that success, They've shaped the industry we work in, they've shaped the internet and the World Wide Web that we all share, and shaped the world around us. You know, the degree of innovation there is remarkable. So whilst all this is going along in the meantime, people like myself are sitting down, we're trying to write websites, and we are caught in the crossfire of the browser wars because every single thing you can possibly try and do, there are three or four different ways of doing it. We all had this. This book was about an inch and a half thick, and it's the only book that no one ever used as a monitor stand because you just had to open it too often. It had about a chapter at the beginning, which was quite good fun to sit down and read because it taught you things, and the rest of it was reference. It was literally page after page after page. Every JavaScript function, every operator, every HTML tag, every CSS rule with a huge table saying this is how it works in this browser, this browser, Internet Explorer 3, Internet Explorer 4, Internet Explorer 4.1, Netscape. It was the most boring book you have ever seen, and it was absolutely essential, because without that reference, you would burn so many cycles on trial and error and trial and error. And one of the interesting things that came around this time was a fad for people putting a little button on their web page saying this is you know, HTML4 valid. The um, World Wide Web Consortium had this online HTML validator. You could tell it your website. And I think one of the reasons that was popular was because for a lot of developers, that was the only bit of your job you could win. Everything else, you got it to work in Netscape, it broke in IE. You got it working in IE, it broke in Netscape. Got it working in both of those, you'd get someone running IE5 on a Mac who would complain that it still wouldn't work for them. You'd have you know, the capabilities of the web weren't understood. You'd have clients coming and asking you for things which were impossible. The only way you could get a sort of definitive thumbs up, you did a good job, was to validate your code. Anyone here ever go through that cycle of going through code you'd written and trying to get that little green tick on the validator? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of fun for a while, wasn't it? Validation is important, but it's not that important. And I think what happened around this time is for a lot of people, like I said, validation was really the only bit you felt you could win. And so you'd, you'd spend probably more time than we should have done focusing on that. Now, the World Wide Web opened up this idea of software development and you know, coding to an awful lot of people to whom hitherto it had been a completely closed door. People were like, hey, I can write HTML. They discovered view source. I can, if anyone was in a Chris Heilman and Rob's talk on Monday night where Chris was talking about how the first time you saw a web page, you could actually go in and take it apart and see how it worked and view source and copy script. It was wonderful, you know. It opened this thing up completely. And the trends that happened, one, code became more and more reusable. We started getting libraries. We started getting frameworks. The framework that really revolutionized it for me. Around this, sort of, you know, while the browser wars are going on, we've got this whole dynamic HTML reference book. The first frameworks were, existed just to give you a level playing field. That's really why a lot of them came into existence. Scriptaculous, Moo tools, prototype, early versions of jQuery. You have to remember, we're coming from a world where get element by ID did not exist. If you had something, if you had a button on your page, and, or you had a, a heading on your page, and you wanted to change the heading, Every browser had a completely different way of identifying the control you were working with, and then they probably had a different way of actually going in and changing it to produce the effect you wanted. Frameworks came along, it was great, you know, breath of fresh air. Suddenly there was some consistency. 
What's interesting is a lot of those uh, frameworks worked kind of like polyfills. They would take behavior which was already in place in up-level browsers, and they would backfill support for it in the down-level browsers so that you could write up-level code. And this is a, a pattern we're seeing an awful lot. We've got things like the uh, ES ECMAScript 6 to 5 transpilers. You know, we've got CSS polyfills. We've got all sorts of clever stuff now following this pattern of let's let people write the next generation of a particular language or a framework or a standard, and then we'll do the hard work of trying to make that work and run on down-level browsers. What it also fostered was a way of thinking about code more in terms of gluing together components and grabbing pieces from repositories and assembling them into a thing than actually implementing systems from scratch. And this meant a lot of people could do some very, very productive things very, very quickly. But once in a while, it would go wrong. So not too many months ago, the internet broke. It basically, for hundreds of developers everywhere, the entire internet stopped working. And the reason it stopped working is no one could publish any updates to their websites. And the reason they couldn't do that is because they were using elements of the node package management system. And it turned out that almost every node package in existence, at some point, someone had gone, I need to pad a string. That sounds really complicated. I'm not sure I'm up to the job. I'm going to try and find a library to solve that problem for me. Now, that's a very, very different way of thinking to the offline, disconnected kind of mindset that anyone who was doing mini and microcomputer programming in the 1980s would have come up with. You know, we all used to have folders full of code. We had our own code, and we would copy and paste it. You can argue the benefits and, and you know, drawbacks of copy and paste code reuse. But the alternative, which is where everything is built in at compile time, and we're taking these dependencies on these complicated chains of modules, leads to this potentially very volatile ecosystem where your code is depending on this enormous stack of layers and components and dependencies underneath it. And a lot of the time, it looks like that stuff just works. And you forget that it's there. I've had this experience several times this year where I've gone, I've cloned a repository onto my laptop just before I get on a plane. I've got on, I've opened it up to do some work, I've hit build, and it's gone, couldn't restore NuGet packages because the code is not enough anymore. We depend to an enormous extent on libraries and frameworks and modules and dependencies. And often, you know, the way in which we depend on those things is not terribly well understood. So, what I'm gonna do now, earlier at the start of this talk, five lucky winners got five floppy disks. Each of those disks, they are real. I had to track them down on eBay from a guy who has a warehouse full of leftover computer stock from the, the golden times. Each of those is 1.44 megabytes, which does not sound like very much at all. You know, I'm over here in Sweden. I've got 500 megs a day of roaming data on my phone, which is kind of, you know, that's just about enough to keep up with what's going on in the world. Which one have you got disk number one? Right. So disk number one, what you've got there, is Elite, the space trading game with eight galaxies, with 8,000 procedurally generated planets. For an entire generation of kids, this was the coolest thing they had ever seen. I was so hooked on Elite when I was a kid that I would go to bed and I would wait until I heard my parents go to bed, and then I'd get up and I'd play all night. And when Dad's alarm clock went off, I would run back up to bed and pretend I'd been asleep the whole time. And then one day I didn't hear his alarm clock because I was chasing some Thargons through null space and I got busted. That was bad. That fit on one floppy disk. And that represented, I mean, it must have been months of absolutely thrilling entertainment for me. One disk. So to go with disk one, lesson number one, takeaway number one, simplicity. The reason the web works, HTML was simple. HTTP was simple, URIs were simple. They were composable. They were simple, easy to understand systems. You could get your head around them, you could get them to interact with each other, you could compose them to build bigger things. They provided standards that meant people didn't need to reinvent everything they did. What I would love to see in the world right now is a standard protocol for the interface between a smartphone and an airline. Because I have this screen, which is where every single airline in the world have gone, we need an app. 
And so they've hired some people and they probably, you know, at the end of the day, you're putting some people in a metal tube and you're launching it into the sky. And they all go through the same airports. They're all subject to the same regulations. If ever there was a problem which is like crying out for someone to just standardize it, and you have one app on your phone, these are all your tickets, these are your flights, these are your check-ins, this is your baggage allowance. Surely it couldn't be that hard, you know? But no, we've come to this point where we reinvent everything from scratch. Simplicity. Disk two. You have, okay, it's in standard MIDI format. You have the complete works of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the finest composers in all of human history. We have a, reached a point now with technology where if you load a MIDI file into a wavetable synthesizer and play it back, it's almost, almost as good as hearing a live symphony orchestra performing it. And thanks to compression technology, we can fit all of that into 1.44 megabytes. Lesson two, to go with disk two, innovation can mean doing less. Look at the system you're working on. Think, could we actually make it better by removing something? Are we brave enough to weather the storm? Do we really have a vision for what is important here that would allow us to discard some of the noise and the unnecessary add-ons and features? Everyone here, myself included, I'm sure you're running systems where you have features that you're pretty sure no one actually needs, but they're there anyway because you're scared to take them away. Try taking them away. See what happens. See how much better things can be. Disk number three. You've got every line of code I wrote in three years as an undergraduate. You've got my parser for dealing with XML files in Prologue. You've got Hello World in every language my professors could think of. You've got my C++ application for simulating traffic lights at junctions. You have three years worth of hard work and toil and bugs and learning and references in 1.44 megabytes. To go with that, it's the biggest mistake Netscape ever did. Netscape died. You know why Netscape died? They decided to rewrite their application. It seems quite incredible now. Netscape were basically on top of the world and they got bought by, there's a company called America Online, AOL, which was like a walled garden dial-up internet service. And AOL became so big, AOL bought Time Warner Communications. Time is Time Magazine and the New York Times and the Washington Post. Warner is Warner Brothers, you know, Marvel Comics, Hollywood, these are huge companies. Imagine a day when someone whose business is dial-up internet is so powerful that they acquire these companies, yeah? So you see it now, it's the AOL Time Warner. It sounds to me like something out of Harry Potter. The AOL Time Warner. I am from the future, your merger will fail. But they bought it. And then they bought Netscape, and then they said to Netscape, come on, we need new shiny, and Netscape went, the code isn't good enough. So they rewrote it. The code survived. The code eventually got spun off, it got open sourced, it turned into Mozilla Phoenix, which turned into Mozilla Firebird, which turned, they kept picking these cool names and then find someone else already had the name and they'd get sued by it. But the big mistake that killed Netscape the brand and Netscape the company was the big rewrite. Go back to the drawing board, build the whole thing again. There is a great, it's several years old now, but a great article from Joel Spolsky about why this is the worst thing you can possibly do. If you have code that people are using, there is value in that code because the value is in the people and the problems you are solving for those people. Big mistake. Do not rewrite your entire application. Disk four. Hamlet by William Shakespeare. One of the finest plays, I think the gold standard for the English language. The English language since the time of Shakespeare, thanks to the fact that children in schools all over the world, when they learn English, they study Shakespeare, it has kept the language stable enough that people like myself who speak nothing else can travel the world speaking English and somehow get away with it time after time. And Hamlet, one of the greatest plays ever written, is there for you in its entirety on your 1.4 meg floppy disk. Lesson four to go with disk four is about frameworks and remembering why they were necessary. There was a time when things like jQuery, Scriptaculous, MooTools, Prototype, they made a genuine material difference to how easily you could solve the problem you were trying to solve. Browsers are a lot smarter now, and an awful lot of the time, your MVP, the application you're trying to deliver, you focus on one important problem and how you solve that problem. You probably don't need all of the frameworks that you think you need. Maybe you don't need any of them at all. 
We sort of thing at the beginning, people stand up who've written JavaScript with no framework. You can achieve an awful lot with that. Before you go reaching for NPM and left pad and Angular and backbone and knockout, think, hang on, what am I, what am I trying to solve here? What am I actually doing? Okay, disk five. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid uh, what I was going to give you didn't fit. Uh, you've got one third of the JavaScript from a BuzzFeed article. And I have some more disks here which have the other two thirds, and then I've got some more that has all the cookies for the advert banner tracks. Bandwidth is cheap. Bandwidth is so cheap we treat it like it's infinite. And so many systems now, we have created this, this environment, this industry, where we regard bandwidth as being effectively unlimited. It's not unusual at all to see three or four megabytes of, as far as you know, I, the reader, are concerned, this is useless content. I don't even need the adverts. Have you ever seen an engineering team where there's like there's two people working on content and then there's three people who are running the infrastructure that runs the advert server? which generates the revenue, which makes up for the fact that the engineering team has to be five people. It's like advertising has become this thing that feeds itself by requiring you have people running it in order you can generate the revenue to pay them to do it. If BuzzFeed was static HTML, if we were running BuzzFeed on that stack I showed you at the beginning, you'd probably do it with one person. You know? But of course, then you wouldn't make any money. So yeah, and the fifth lesson to go with that, understand dependencies. You can do incredible things by taking building blocks and solutions that have been shared by other people, this wonderful spirit of openness and collaboration that typifies the industry we work in. But remember what you're doing. If there's stuff you need in order to compile your solutions, get it on your laptop before you get on a plane. If you have dependencies that you need to install to be able to push a critical bug fix to production, put a caching proxy in front of NPM or in front of NuGet.org. Just keep copies of this stuff. It's not actually that difficult to do. And what it means is that even if the infrastructure that you're relying on goes away, you'll still be able to build and deploy your own applications. And finally, remember that stack. Files, server, transport, client. Because using that stack, you can still put something online that anyone in the world with a connection can go on and read. I've been following the tweets from a conference going on in London where someone's showing off the Space Jam website. Has anyone seen the Space Jam website? It was put up in 1996. It's never been updated. It's brilliant. It's like the most retro thing ever, and it still works. Any one of you here can go to the Warner Brothers movies, go to Space Jam, it'll work on your phone because it used what was available on this stack all those years ago, and none of it has been deprecated. This is the stack that changed the world, and don't lose sight of that. Thank you.